Uh, I love the liveliness, the, the constant feeling of energy. Definitely the world-class education. The diversity. Nah, <laughs> the nightlife. I would say the people. For me, it's the stories. My name is Mo Waja, and welcome to Toronto Story Archive. Hello, hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Toronto Story Archive. I love that being a nerd is cool now. As a career nerd, that being a nerd is cool in 2017 just really sits well with me. No, seriously though, I throw this out pretty flippantly, but I love that the freedom to indulge in pursuits formerly perceived as, as geeky or nerdy in that disparaging fashion are recognized and applauded now. I love that people like Felicia Day are celebrities. I love that you can have a strong vocabulary without being accused of reading the dictionary, as if, as if that was a bad thing. That's where I learned the word lauded. The dictionary is awesome. Anyway, I love that the people around us are lauded for their intelligence and ingenuity, so that the rock stars of tomorrow are the geeks of yesterday. When I was growing up, that wasn't always the case though. I've talked before on Toronto Story Archive on entering engineering at the University of Toronto and then failing out after only one semester. but. I haven't really talked about how I even chose to go into chemical engineering in the first place. See, I never really fit in in my formative years. I was complete rubbish at anything sports, so that took me out of the running for classic popularity. I was quote unquote smart, but then again I was pretty terrible at people, so I couldn't even find a real space with my fellow social outcasts. But where I began to find my stride was when I was first introduced to my high school science fair. Now in my school we were forced to do the science fair as part of our course load. When the time of year came, we'd all pair up and put together our projects. The ones that didn't suck would have the opportunity to be featured at the North Bay Regional Science Fair. I participated a couple of times in the science fair, but, but only, only one or two of those times are actually notable. The first year I attended the North Bay Science Fair was in grade 9. I partnered up with a very much more athletic friend of mine, Greg, and, and so we decided to do something sporty since one of us was good at math and the other already had a strong grasp of sports science. I'll let you decide who was who. What we decided to test was whether or not Gatorade was as useful as it claimed to be for athletes. Spoiler alert, it is not. Anyway, it was a sort of successful project. We did fairly well at the science fair. We also made some truly excellent naming decisions. Our first name was, for some reason, based off Nike. We decided to call our project Just Did It. A play on the slogan, Just Do It. Then it was pointed out to us that this might be misinterpreted. So instead, we decided to make a play on Gatorade's slogan, Is It In You? We called our project, Do I Need It In Me? The best part was that we didn't get why this wasn't better. Anyway, the better project came about in my final year of high school, where I worked on a project to use electricity to break down carcinogenic textile dyes in underground water tables. I know, super impressive, right? I called this one, Remediation sensation. I'm so good at names. It's legit why I went into marketing. The project actually won first place at North Bay's regional science fair, giving me the opportunity to present at the Canada-wide science fair in Ottawa. Now, I didn't win. I took home a couple of awards, but I didn't win. But what attending that science fair did do was spark an interest in chemistry that led me on the path to chemical engineering, a path that, no matter how it turned out, I do not regret one bit. For it was a path that would introduce me to some of the best friends I've ever had, friends who have become like family to me. It also introduced me to some of the most forward-thinking, intelligent, and straight-up impressive women I've ever had the pleasure and, in many ways, the honor of meeting. When I was talking to my fiancé about this week's guest, she mentioned how impressive it was that she was in STEM. That's science, technology, engineering, and math. Other people are good at names, too. She also mentioned that through a variety of social and cultural factors, these have historically been male-dominated fields that have not really been open or inviting to women. But through the hard work of people like today's guest, this is changing. This week, I have the pleasure of chatting with Janan Abdurrahman. Janan is, in her words, an engineer by day and a STEM and robotics teacher by night. She is a process engineer who spends her time on weekends and after work teaching elementary school robotics to grade 2 and 3 students. Moreover, Janan is a key member in the planning of the Women in Engineering and Science Design Competition, which takes place every July. Coming at us from Mississauga, welcome Janan! Hey, thank you for having me. 
Janan, how are you doing today? Good, how are you? Oh, pretty good, pretty good. It's summer in Toronto, best time ever. And so I want to start by asking you the one major question that we ask everyone who comes on Toronto Story Archive, and that is, what is one thing you love about Toronto? Well, I would have to say that the one thing that I love about Toronto would probably be the opportunity. Um, okay. Nowhere else have I heard stories like I've heard in Toronto. When I was studying at Ryerson, um, I would try and speak to as many people as I could, older and younger, and now I work with a lot of older people as well. And just the career paths that people have taken have are so inspiring, and I realize that it's only in such a metropolitan city like Toronto that we could they could have those opportunities. Like you have people who start off in engineering like yourself and then go into marketing or public speaking or now have a podcast introducing everyone else to all these <laughs> different different people and like myself I thought I was going to be a teacher or a lawyer and now I'm a I do robotics pretty much 15 hours a day um I've heard of people who are in business and now they're running pizza shops and on islands so that opportunity and that being able to see what your passion is and really driving your career through your passion is something that I feel is very um descriptive of Toronto that's very true and that's very cool you know I mean I was scrolling through Facebook the other day and it just, it blew my mind what all of the different people are doing nowadays. I have a friend who started his own media company. Uh, another friend of mine who was in, I think like finance or something is now, is now in interviewing celebrities for, for a magazine. I have another friend who, I mean, I actually interviewed him on the podcast. He used to be in entertainment and club promotion and now he's an investment. He's like, he's a, he's an investment and financial advisor. So I mean, it, it's very true the way that people's paths change. Even my own, like as you said, I went from engineering to I studied business with a major in law, like I was going to be a lawyer, and now I do marketing, consulting, and podcasting. It's it's so cool how people's paths change. But I mean, I want to first, I guess, congratulate you because engineering is rough. Like it's it's a rough scene, you know. So I mean, what? How did you go from maybe being a teacher or a lawyer to to now being an engineer and and teaching robotics on top of it? Um. Well, I had a really good teacher when I was in high school. Who, when I asked them, I was so confused about what I wanted to do after high school, as I think most people are, because it's such a daunting decision, but you have to make it. And so I tried to get some advice, and I spoke to my teachers and. I had a physics teacher who was like, you know what, I know that you want to be a teacher or a lawyer, but why don't you keep your options open? Why don't you go into engineering? I think you'll be good at it and try it out. And I know it's not something you should just try out. He didn't mention that part, that engineering is not something you should just try out. But <laughs> he's like, try it out and maybe it will work out for you. And um, maybe even if, even if you don't decide to be an engineer at the end of it, you can go to teacher's college with any – sort of science degree if you want to teach science. So you could still be a teacher ultimately. So I applied for engineering and I decided to go into aeronautical or aerospace engineering. Oh, wow. Yeah, I chose I chose what sounded the coolest and ended up being probably <laughs> the hardest. And that's what happens when you go into a major that you haven't necessarily looked into too much that you've been recommended to go into. Um, and you're right. It is a monster and it is definitely one of the hardest things that I've ever done and I think it will remain that for a long time but um, I guess it would be worth it because it introduced me to I guess what my passion is and it helped me realize that my teacher was right I could do engineering and stay in sciences and still teach and teach young kids what I learned and I didn't have the opportunity to learn so that was one thing that I found really special about engineering for me I love it. I love that you are able to actually balance both passions, right? The, the passion for science and engineering and then and then connect it to to like your, your love of teaching children. So, I mean, uh, for me and for everyone else out there, you say you went into to aeronautics and engineering. I mean, I hear that. I think planes. I think space. And I'm not sure how that connects to, to robotics. So, what about that next step? So... My story is a little bit all over the place right now. I'm still growing, as many people are. But For sure. I went into um, aerospace engineering, and it was my first year. I was crushing math and science, calculus, chemistry. Those those were those were great for me. 
And then I took some engineering courses like design, and I'm sure that many girls will feel my pain on this, but you take courses like design or electronic or coding, and it's a completely different way of thinking that a lot of young girls are not accustomed to because they don't have the background that young boys do. And I'm not sure, I haven't done a lot of research into this, but I have watched a few TED Talks. Um, that's going to be my first <laughs> for, a little, for a few things. But a lot of female engineers lack facial skills, and they, they, they have a hard time grasping things that male engineers go into first year knowing because they had the opportunity to build when they were younger or take things apart. Mm -hmm. There's that stereotypical young boy who, you know, takes apart the fridge or the microwave, that little inventor, and you never see that girl because she's not usually encouraged to do those kinds of things. That's like messy and dirty and you want to get your clothes dirty. And so, you know, even now, I think that it's amazing that there are so many more toys that are available for young girls that are more hands-on and building based or more logical thinking based. But when I was growing up, I had like a whole tub of Barbies, like (laughs) a huge tub of Barbies. And, like, I don't ever remember trying to take them apart. I mean, I dressed them up, but I would never take them apart. I didn't want to see how they worked. I just wanted to make them look pretty and, you know, pretend that we were a family. That was what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so when I went into engineering, I had to learn a completely new way of thinking, and it was very intimidating. Um, But what I found was that there were certain things that I was better at. I wasn't necessarily very strong and I wouldn't say that I'm strong now either in a lot of the mechanical design or taking something like an idea and coming up with a fully functional design for it. I wouldn't say that's my strength, but something that I was good at was the electronic side of it and, you know, the more logical thinking coding side of it. Even though I did aerospace, I specialized in more of like a control systems electronic side of it. So then when I graduated, I decided to go into process control but on the way there I decided that in order to get stronger at that electronic side I would build little robots <laughs> that's cool is it well um, over the summer some of my friends and I we get together once every three weeks four weeks or so and we build with this little thing called an Arduino it's like a little microcontroller and it has you can attach like resistors and they have little Like, it's basically like a hobbyist kit. It's a hobbyist kit for electronics people that maybe are not engineers or maybe they are engineers and it has, like, a very simple programming language that comes with it. And it's supposed to be, for a little bit of an older audience, maybe university level, but you can get through it. You can make a little robot that blinks a light. And then you can make one that has wheels and rolls around your apartment. And I was so inspired inspired by this. I loved it. I loved every second of building. So what I did was I started like writing down ideas and challenges and we'd have challenges like every four weeks and we'd have to come up with a robot, come up with a design, do the coding in six hours. So we'd have to make wow. do our, from our challenge and then build right through for six hours. And we never finished a robot. Not one time did we make a working <laughs> robot. Not even once. But we learned so much and it helped reinforce all those things that we learned in school that we never really got to practice. And for me, it helped me learn things that I never had been exposed to. So I wasn't lacking behind in school. Um, And from there I said, you know, I'm doing this now in my twenties, but what about little girls who are like eight? What if they want to build little robots and how can we help them build little robots and even come up with the ideas? So I started teaching at a school in Mississauga um, in the evenings while I was in university and I was teaching grade twos and threes using like Lego based projects. And that's Mm -hmm. when I also started volunteering with women engineering, coming up with competitions that were four days long, but you have a challenge and it's your job to come up with a solution for that challenge. And it's hopefully a real world challenge that engineers might actually face. For sure. No, that's really cool. That's really cool. I mean, I mean, you say, is it, but, but it is though, right? Because you know, it, it's it's funny, right? You mentioned this one thing that I that I want to touch on, and and that's that I I didn't know exactly what you meant when you said that 
that female engineers or other girls might affect with this, but that you, you came into engineering without the same, I guess, spatial skills that other boys have growing up. And I, and I didn't get what you mean by that, but the way you paint the picture, it makes sense. Because even, even I mean, when I was growing up, there's a, there's a difference, you know, between what, what boys are necessarily as kids encouraged to do and, and what girls are encouraged to do. And luckily, that is changing on some level now. I mean, as evidence of this, you had a tub of Barbies, I had a tub of, of Star Wars action figures, which are essentially Barbies with blasters and lightsabers. Just saying. But yeah, no, it's, it's true though. Right. There's there's a definitely a difference in the way that that kids are educated uh, from a male and female perspective. So now that you're, I guess, I guess in in the workforce, you're, you're in engineering. How have you found that, I guess, relationship in this historically male dominated field coming in as as a young female and an engineer? Um, I was worried initially about it because I had a few friends who worked so in my class of 110 aerospace engineers, we were maybe eight girls, maybe. Okay. So we were already very limited in number. Some of my friends went off and did internships, and they were like, oh, Janam, it's such a male-dominated field. You know when they say that, they mean it. It's such a male-dominated field. It's such a boys' club. And I was like, oh, okay, that's a little bit intimidating. Um and so when I started working, I actually didn't go into aerospace specifically. I'm I'm in more of a chemical engineering kind of a company, and I do okay. control systems for them. So I was like, oh, it's going to be chemical engineering. It'll be less. But even on my team, we do have more women, and my lead is actually a woman. Our customers, oh, okay. Yeah, our customers are more male. But mm -hmm. what I realized through engineering, to be honest, is that Sometimes being the only girl or being one of any number in any group, even if it's not male, female, if it's one of anything in a group of anything else, you could really use that as like a self, as a term of empowerment. You could, you realize that, you know, maybe you're meant to be there and maybe you're bringing something different. They hired you for a reason and maybe you're bringing a different perspective. And I think that a lot of female engineers, want that they want that female perspective on engineering and on design and on you know coding and everyone does something a little bit different and female engineers are going to do something a little bit different than male engineers and I've had instances in my work right now where I have five male customers and I'm the only female engineer leading the leading that project and it's, <laughs> it's so intimidating and there were nights where I was so worried that you know, they would just think of me as like some dumb girl because that's just so stereotypically mm -hmm. true. And that's just the honest, that's just honesty about it. You do feel sure. like that sometimes. You're like, oh, you know, they're just, they're not going to listen to anything I say. They know better. Even if you know that you know your stuff, somewhere in the pit of your stomach, you're like, ah, oh, maybe they know better than me. Or, you know, even though I've been working on this project for six months, maybe they'll be able to disprove the whole thing in like one sentence. And then what would I mm -hmm. say? What, where's my backbone? But when you're in that situation, you find that confidence and you find that, you know what, like I've worked hard and I'm the same as anyone else who's been working hard here. I'm the same as any of the male engineers. And I think a lot of it is due to this whole movement right now. Like I think we really are in a women in engineering and science movement. And there are a lot of people who are trying to advocate for this and who are trying to say like, you know what, we want to feel like we are normal, like we are a normal, whereas we want people mm -hmm. to close their eyes and when they picture an engineer, I'm not so shocking that, that when they open their eyes and they see me, you know what I mean? Or like if I'm corresponding yeah. with a customer, they're, they could be expecting a female on the other side. So that whole, that whole movement is really helping with this. And, um, but it is still lacking because even in, the classes that I teach, like I think that I teach maybe 40 students in a, in a year, mm -hmm. in a school year from September to June. And I think I have three female students out of 40. So it still is a problem. And I'm not sure um, where the problem is because I know schools are really trying to 
push this women in science and girls in science and girls in tech and girls in coding. Um, and I'm not sure if it's the parents who still want to hold on to this idea of like, oh, but if my girl, if my daughter does these things, then maybe she's not so girly. And, you know, maybe she's testing mm-hmm. like gender roles or gender, like gender biases. Maybe she's, maybe these lines shouldn't be crossed. I don't know where the problem is, to be honest, but we are trying to get better at it. And I think that the girls who are coming out of engineering and tech and science and even business and other male dominated fields, because engineering is not the only male dominated field. It's just one of the For ones sure. that are more vocal. But any of these male dominated fields, the girls who are coming out of it, they they hold their own. They they have a they have, they're sassy. Like they, they you know <laughs> they stand up for what they want and they make sure that they are they are heard. You know. Absolutely. I mean, it it's it's a challenge, right? It's it's a it's a constant challenge that that we face across across many fields. Like you said, not just engineering, because it, it even even on on the element of of you know those girls are, are sassy they stand up for themselves there's there's another word that a lot of i mean a lot of people would use to describe that a, a not so a not so polite word that more and more people are trying that we're all collectively trying to push people away from and i think that speaks to the fact that there's i guess this this, this systemic misunderstanding or misinterpretation of what women's role and what female role roles are in in the workforce and and it's funny as you're talking about you know close your eyes and think of an engineer and think of someone who what they look like i mean i was just thinking back to to a board game i think it's called pandemic and you have different roles in the board game and the engineer one is of course some guy you know and it just it just it, it clicked in my head right there as you're as you're describing it the the challenge that even in our media the role of the engineer is reserved for some guy rather than both men and women. So, I mean, I know you said that you, you don't know where it comes from. And you mentioned a few ways that, I guess, people are going about trying to trying to change the, the game and change the narrative. But, I mean, how do you think that we should go about that? I'm not, I'm not just talking about the institutions, mind you, right? I'm talking, talking everyone, people who aren't even a part of that field of engineering. What's, how, how do you think we can change that story? I think that I was walking around like Walmart and I was looking around at like the toys and starting from a younger age. I think that one of the most important things is that it starts from a younger age because not that you can't get into engineering or science or tech or coding when you're older. I did and I loved it Mm -hmm. and I stayed with it. But I think that for a lot of, it's so important to encourage it from a younger age because then that realm of what it is that you want to do or what it is that you're good at is is broader and you kind of have a better understanding of where you want to go or what you want to do. Um, so for the first thing was like starting younger. And I know that, like, as I mentioned, there are so, it, it's amazing to see the technology that's out there right now for young kids, there are little robots that they make for three-year-olds. Like wow. three-year-olds can build circuits now. And it's it's so amazing. But the thing is, is that they're not marketed well because mm-hmm. the reason that I found out about a lot of these things is because I've extensively searched, trying to, you know, develop new courses for all different age groups for the school that I teach at. For sure. So we do a lot of research into what what can we use and how can we teach it so that you know they ha- students have fun but they're still learning and it's it's still kind of it's not like a school environment where they dread going but they're having fun but retaining these concepts so what can we do so we did a lot of research and i have an uncle who's an engineer he had been buying these similar things for his nephew but then when you look at other parents that i that i we're in like a, I'm in an age where a lot of, you know, friends and family friends are having kids. So when you look at other parents <laughs> Absolutely. have kids and they look at their toys, they're not necessarily any different. One thing that parents are really proud of now is that their kids are so good with technology in terms of iPads. Like, oh, my kid can, they're six months old and they can open the iPad and they can go on YouTube and search up Peppa Pig. And, you know, it's so awesome. They can do mm-hmm. all these things, but they could use that same iPad and learn those, use that iPad for other things to learn 
more about coding or logical thinking or engineering related concepts that they don't even realize but the parents themselves are not exposed to it through marketing and media so they don't know that it's even out there sometimes when I like talk to parents of my students and I'm telling them about certain things that their kid can do over the summer they feel like they need to be in a classroom like my kid cannot do robotics unless they're in your class and I'm like that's mm-hmm. not true at all there are literally hundreds of products out there that your kid can use when they're at home that you know they might even enjoy more than robotics and yeah maybe I won't have a job after this but it's fine <laughs> because the goal is that they in, that they get this experience with these things so I think that a huge, based on my teaching experience, I think that a huge portion of it is just exposure to these things. And I think that it's always been an issue from, from I was a kid. I think that toys like this or activities like this or programs like this have existed, but for some reason they're just not marketed well or they're not, you know, they're not the race cars or they're different. And so Mm -hmm. maybe... I I do not have a business background, so I cannot talk much to marketing or anything like that. But um, I know that it's just like a lack of knowledge for the parents. They don't see these things, and maybe they don't have time to look them up or find them. So they are not able to expose their kids the way they want to. No, it's very true. I mean, you know, you talk about the marketing background. I was watching, I was watching television weirdly enough because i don't usually watch television on a tv anymore so i don't usually get the advertisements but but there was a television on right and and i'm watching it and i and i saw this toy this really really cool like lightning mcqueen toy that was a a race car that uh, you know it moved its eyebrows it talked it looked like the thing from the movie and it was super cool And, and i guess you're right it does come down to marketing marketing things with flash and it also comes down like you said to a change in perspective on what defines education so ryerson uh, ryerson both of our alma mater is, is a prime example because they've moved from just focusing on you know classroom learning classroom learning classroom learning all the way through to now zone learning where it's practical and people are actually you know be it the fashion zone the digital media zone or i don't even know if they call it that anymore just the dmz now i guess <laughs> yeah or, or exactly or otherwise all of those things are phase, are based on practical learning. And I guess that's kind of a, 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 men, a bit of mental gymnastics that many of the new parents going in are, are going to need to go into. But there's an element of what you're doing that I also really like on this. And I, and I want your perspective both. Well, I want to hear more about it. And I also want your perspective on, on how this element plays a role. And that's I like that what you're doing with your, your women in, in engineering and, and design science competition I like that there's a competitive edge to it because I feel like that has that has more of a draw that also in a way speaks to and I might just be like drawing random uh, like random convergences here where, where none exist but I feel like it speaks in a way to that challenge that you were discussing when people are you know getting up and, and they're worried that am I am I going to be able to present on this project or is someone going to come at me and tell me I'm wrong you did all of this wrong some guy is going to mm. tell me I did all of this wrong so what role do you think, tell me a bit more about the competition and what role do you think building that competitive edge in at a young age can play, even if it doesn't necessarily play a role right now? So, yeah, the Women in Engineering and Science Design Competition is an annual competition. We've been running it for four years and mm-hmm. it is founded by Toronto Rehab. So what's really cool about okay. that is that the woman who founded it was she works um, for Toronto, the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute and she is also the chair for the women engineering for the professional engineers of Ontario and what she noticed was that she wanted to be able to give more exposure to young girls, younger girls in science mm-hmm. and engineering fields because they have so many labs and at Toronto, Rehabil- at Toronto Rehab they have so many labs and all these great things that they wanted students to be able to get exposure to so she wanted to hold a competition Um, and it had to be rehabilitation focused so what she did was the first year she chose a topic of fall prevention in the elderly and she had 20 kids 20 students and she said okay what I want you to do is you can design anything you want and we're going to teach you a really simple software and it's 
called Tinker and Tinkercad, sorry, and you're going to design it and you're going to make it on Tinkercad and we're going to 3D print it and then you're going to present to the judges. And from there it grew. That's really cool. Yeah, and now our registration is capped at 75 just because we don't have enough volunteers, not because we don't have the registration, but because we can't find enough volunteers to, you know, be able to give everyone the knowledge that they need for the competition. So mm -hmm. um, every year we choose a different theme, and every year, and ever since that first year, we've also decided to add an element of business because we realized that not only are younger students, not even just women, not, uh, not even just girls, even boys, they're not able to understand what certain things are. If you were to ask like a grade six student, what is marketing? They wouldn't really know what a marketer does. Or if you ask them what an engineer does, they don't really know what an engineer does. They know what a doctor does. They know what a teacher does. But those careers that they could have and could potentially really enjoy, they don't necessarily know what those people do. And in high school, someone always used to tell me, like, you know what you need to do? If you want to you wanna find out what you want to do, you need to shadow people. You need to go and talk mm -hmm. to everyone, and you need to go and shadow them for a day at their job. But at 16, that's so intimidating to, you know, message an engineer oh, and say, you know what, I want to I wanna shadow you. It should be more <laughs> common knowledge, you know, what an engineer does or what someone in marketing does or what an investment banker does. Someone in high school should be able to say, like, you know what, I kind of know what that person does. Whereas I was in university and I still didn't know anything about stock. So, mm -hmm. you know, there are certain things that I think that we lack in terms of common knowledge. So through the competition, we didn't want to just focus on engineering and science. We wanted to make these career options that could be possible for all of these students for them to gain some exposure from it. So we do a little bit of marketing. We've done some, like, costing and inventory. We've done... Um, so we try and have some sort of business aspects to it, as well as engineering and science and research. Um, and that's kind of a little bit of an overview of the competition and what we try and do mm -hmm. every year. And the competition style of it, because we um, gear the competition to a little bit of an older audience, maybe like high school and beginning of high school, grade 9 and 10, 8, 9 and 10. So For sure. we found that as motivation – um, to come up with something really innovative because that is their goal. Their goal is to spend four days on a topic and come up with something that's innovative and exciting and to understand who their audience is and create something that their audience could feasibly use. So having a competition aspect to it motivates them to really think about it, do, do research, and not just, you know, it's not just day camp is what it is. You know, you're there for four days eating with your friends, but we don't want it to just be camp. We want you to leave with something. We want you to leave with an idea that you're proud of and an idea that your parents are proud of. Last year, we did app development, and there were parents like, that's it. My kid's a genius, and we're going to, you know, we got to make sure that we copyright this app. And we had parents excited, not just the students excited about what they had made and, you know, the competition, but the parents were excited thinking that, you know, my, my, my child has a future, like, in this, maybe. If they like it, they have a future in this. And, you know, it's exciting to be the drive for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, again, it's education that takes place on multiple levels. Because I guess we're, we're a product, in a way, of the way in which we grew up. Which is, which is not a bad thing. Don't get me wrong. It's not a bad thing. But it does, I guess guide our ideas our perspectives and our expectations so i mean to use to like kind of flippantly use your example right if if you grew up with barbie dolls your mom grew up with barbie dolls and and her mom before her grew up with barbie dolls then it's kind of ingrained in a way for you to think oh well i mean i have a girl now let me let me give her some barbie dolls you know exactly. similar to like and it happens on a positive side as well like for me i grew up reading a ton of books uh, a ton of fantasy and science fiction, right? So, I mean, I guarantee you that no matter no matter what gender my child ends up being, I'm also at least going to try and encourage them to read a lot of the same because I feel like it developed my imagination significantly. But, you know, I love what you said there about, about the kids, they don't know what these jobs are, you know? So, like, when I was growing up, it was, it was I wanted to be a doctor because my parents were doctors. But, you know, it's only as you learn about about all of these different avenues as you grow older that you really get 
uh, an opportunity to discover what they are, where they are, you know, like what marketing is at all. So, I mean, I guess my question for you is, so how do you, let's say you're capped at, at 75. So let's talk year 2018. How do, how do people, how do parents get their kids involved in this? How old do they have to be? Uh, you know, what's, what I mean, I don't usually ask this on Toronto Story Archive because I like to I like to keep it story based. But I do think that this is important. And if there are parents out there listening, uh, you know, right now, this might be something that they that they want that the knowledge and information that they need. So, I mean, twenty year twenty eighteen, twenty nineteen, twenty twenty. How do how do people get their kids involved? So um, we have social media. You are. I guess handle is W I E S design competition and we have a website. So if mm-hmm. you just search in Google W I E S design competition, it should be the first link that comes up. And then from there, it takes you through our entire website, talks a little bit about who we are, our team. We're completely nonprofit. So there is a cover for the competition itself because of, for example, food and mm-hmm. um, venue. But of course, what another really cool thing that has been happening since because now this is our fourth year we've got a lot of interest in sponsoring spots so we've had the professional engineers of Ontario say like okay we want you to open a certain number of spots and we will we will pay for them so please just mm-hmm. get students involved and find the students who want to learn these things and who maybe don't even have the access to it and get them involved and we'll pay for that for them to attend this competition and we'll pay their costs so even if we're not non like discriminatory in any way. If you need like financial aid, we have a financial aid package. Um, we allow boys, girls, everyone in between. We are we just want to get the knowledge out there and you know get these kids excited about these topics: science, technology, engineering, and math. And you know get them exposed. So just search us on Facebook or Google, Twitter. I don't know any of the other ones. But all the social media, we have them, so those ones. But, um, yeah, and I can even provide any more information if you need it. Absolutely. No, I, again, I, I don't usually – I have a whole thing on, on maintaining a non-pitchy podcast. But, you know, for things like this, the information needs to get out there because I totally agree with you that – the need for for education is real and that and that a lot of fields you know other even fields that we wouldn't expect remain the these these male dominated strongholds you know and it's something that needs that needs to change it's some it's a level of innovation that needs to change so i i mean i guess what's so your your competition's growing you're an engineer now i mean a, a fairly fresh engineer I think a few years into her career, what's next? Like, where do you where do you go from here? Uh, what does what is next for an engineer in Toronto? Well, for me, for me particularly, um, I would like to grow further within my career as an engineer, but also, you know, try and expand this further, like for out of out of just Toronto and go even further if we can with with STEM-based education. Um, that's the goal for me for that side of things. Um, as an engineer in Toronto, to be honest, I know a lot of students are, they are having a little bit of a hard time finding jobs. And that is just what I've found out of experience with my friends. Um, but I know that with things like automation coming, um, they're expecting a huge, a huge burst of jobs and, and like with technology growing t- Toronto, I've learned is somewhere that if you have an, an idea and you know that you have an audience for it, if you can get it off the ground, you could, you could do whatever you wanted. And like I said, like That's one of fantastic. my favorite things about Toronto is the opportunity and it's just everywhere. I, um, my parents have a little place in Toronto, um, and we have we see all walks of life. And we've seen students who started university, now they, they've been in their job maybe 10 years, they leave their job, they, you know, come up with some great idea. There was this um, 
company. I'm not really 100% from the details, but it was a student in kinesiology, and he noticed that from studying so much, his back was just hurting. So mm-hmm. he came up with some sort of a device to wear under your clothes that adjusts your posture. Okay. And he now he works out of Mars um, downtown, and he's, you know, building up his ideas. So I think that it's not so much about being an engineer in Toronto or anything in Toronto. It's sort of figuring out what it is that you want to do. And if you have an audience for it, and if you are willing to put in the work, then honestly, you could be anything in Toronto. And that's one of the most beautiful things about the city is that it's just so endless with opportunities. And even on the, on the terms of education, one thing that's also great is that, you know, you could learn anything. And that's some, one of the most beautiful things about being a person is that you can learn. If you really mm-hmm. want to learn something, you could learn it. And so I don't think that it's necessarily about where engineering is going in Toronto. I don't know exactly where it's going. Um, I know that automation is big and I know that tech is really big right now. But if you know, even if you have something else that you want to learn and you want to do it, Toronto is the place to do that because there are two amazing universities in like three colleges and even in terms of like little classes that you can take, you could learn like German and Chinese and you could learn landscape, you learn whatever you want. It's amazing. <laughs> no, that's so true. That is, that is so true. I mean, okay, I was going to go in a very different direction, but you did mention one thing that, that I do want to ask you about. And it's because it's an opportunity to, to debunk something that I didn't even realize might be a myth until just now. And that's, so automation's coming, technology's coming. I was just watching uh, the television show Designated Survivor. And in, in one conference, press conference, this guy asks the president, he says, automation means that I'm going to lose my job. What are you going to do about that? And I think that's a very real fear. That's a very real fear that people have that once automation comes, their job is going to go. We're seeing layoffs all over the place, you know? So, I mean, I guess, what does automation mean for you? Does that mean more jobs? Does that mean an influx of, of new people with new opportunities? Or is it, you know, the doomsday scenario that many people like to paint it? I think it's a mix of both, to be honest. I think that there will be a lot of jobs required for people with very specific skill sets. And I think that's why a lot of the push in schools is towards science, technology, engineering, coding. They're starting to learn coding and design because a lot of the future of technology will require people with a specific skill set to maintain that technology or to, you know, keep it updated or those types of things but in the sense of losing jobs i completely understand that as well because it's not incorrect um automation Mm -hmm. is is meant to eliminate human error and if you eliminate human error you eliminate a human operator if you eliminate a human operator you're eliminating a job because someone (laughs) out there is an operator whether it's driving whether it's machine operation whether it's teaching, what it's anything. Automation is meant to eliminate a lot of the human side of that. So it it is kind of like a iRobot situation, but it won't be that intense. <laughs> um, but there will, it's, that's why it's kind of like a mix of both because there will be a need. And that's how come a lot of engineering graduates right now, or they're telling and because a lot of engineering graduates right now are having trouble finding jobs. They're discouraged. They're, you know, telling people, like, it's, there's no jobs here. I don't know why I became an engineer. But people who have been in industry who are seeing industry trends are saying, like, don't discourage engineering now because in mm-hmm. five years we're going to need it. Or in ten years we're going to need engineers. We're going to need engineers by the dozens. We're going to need coders. We're going to need people in computer science and maintenance. And all of those things will need them people with a specific skill set will be required for the, to maintain that technology. But um, yes, I think that it will affect some of the other jobs that we know, and we will phase out certain industries for sure. And I think that's just, that is the reality. But I think that 
on that note, historically, it's happened every age and people have always adapted. So it's not that you're te- because the education is changing as well. So it's not like you're teaching students the way that students were taught in the 1950s and expecting them to work in automation in 10 years. You're teaching sure. students and trying to prepare them for that so that when they get out of university, they're ready. So I think that, I think that society as a whole and humanity as a whole has always been, I know technology is advancing a lot faster than society has typically advanced, but mm-hmm. over usually there is some sort of like trying upkeep. They try and keep up with it with technology and with advancements as much as possible. So maybe even if our generation is not ready, maybe if we have kids or grandkids, their generation will be ready and they'll be suited to those jobs that are available. Absolutely true. I mean, and I guess the really exciting part, uh, the exciting part about that is that we in Toronto on, on the cutting edge of, of innovation in, in Canada in many, in many real ways, are going to be on the front. We're going to be seeing that happen. Uh, you know, we're going to be we're going to be at ground zero in the eye of the storm, watching that take place. Which I mean, I think is just is just really exciting. You know, so exciting. Toronto's Absolutely. Amazing for innovation. Oh, a hundred percent, hundred percent. You know, I mean, I remember back when I was in back when I was in university when and when I was in university that was before the fashion zone had come about and when the digital media zone was still in part tied to tied more tightly to one of the student groups there rather than being the the dmz powerhouse incubator that it is now so it is it is fascinating how these things evolved and it's so i guess cool is the best word for it it's so cool to be on the cutting edge of that evolution right here in toronto so i guess on that note janan i i want to ask you the other main question that we ask everyone who comes on Toronto Story Archive, and that is, if you could recommend one place to go or one thing to do in the city, what would it be? Um, the one place that I would have to recommend to go because I went there all through university and it's just a great place to unwind and let out some laughs would be Yuck Yucks on Richmond. I used to, I went there for most of the big events of my university career I like went for like those late shows like 10 30 and just after when everyone's after dinner everyone's trying to unwind just get out a laugh um i've seen Mm -hmm. some amazing shows there seen some not so amazing shows there but no matter (laughs) no matter if they have like a headliner or not you will laugh Mm -hmm. whether you're laughing with the comedian or at the comedian is different but you will get a good laugh in and I think that would have to be my place. It's kind of a little bit, you know, not like a very polished place, but it's just awesome. The people are really nice. It's great. Well, I mean, it doesn't have to be polished, right? Uh, I, I, for a comedy club, all it really has to do is make you laugh. Thank you so much for Janan for joining us on Toronto Story Archive. That was That was truly fascinating. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And that's a wrap for this week's episode of Toronto Story Archive. Each episode, we bring on guests from Toronto to tell us a story, any story about their life in the city. Our commitment is to not sell, pitch, or bore you. Our goal is to amuse, excite, and at the end of the day, entertain you with stories told by the many voices Toronto has to offer. If you have a story to share, shoot me an email to submissions at torontostoryarchive.com. My name is Mo Waja, and thank you. Thank you for tuning in to Toronto Story Archive.